So it's interesting. Um, as Tom said, I come from uh, the world of technology and cybersecurity. So when we were talking before about uh, vendor assessments and insurance and how they relate to cybersecurity, I was trying not to jump out of my seat, right, because I wanted to engage in that conversation. So if anybody wants to engage in that conversation, I'm happy to do that. But what we're going to be talking about today is uh, patent trolls and its application to blockchain. And the standard disclaimer, because I am a lawyer, right? Uh, all content is presented for general advice. It is not legal advice. Uh, and we strongly urge that you talk to your lawyer, or a lawyer, or me, about your specific legal rights and options. So let's go, um, let's go start off with patent trolls. And by the way, I, don't, I, I have until 2 o'clock. I'm not going to take much more time than that, even though we're a few minutes later than that. If anybody would like to discuss anything in this presentation or anything else, let me know, because I know we have a full agenda, and I don't want to also uh, have you guys think too much about legal issues. Uh, and in that vein, what we're going to be talking about today is more from a policy perspective. So we're not going to drill down into specific legal issues around patents or intellectual property or even blockchain, but from a policy perspective, you know, what are patent trolls? Are they a good thing? Are they a bad thing? Are they evil? And maybe I'll start off with that question. Who in the room thinks that patent trolls across the board are evil? Does anybody have an alternative view on that? So everybody in the room thinks that they're evil. Does everybody know, does it, do you have an alternative view on whether patent trolls are evil? I, I think depending on a situation, it's, it, it's not necessarily a bad thing because if you can help monetize something that you're, you're actually increasing its value, it doesn't mean people are gonna like it. Depends which side of the uh, fence you're on. So that's a very, very interesting perspective, right? Because there are very few things in this world that are inherently good or evil, right? And patent trolls may fall into that category. By the way, does everybody know what a patent troll is in the audience? Does everybody not know what a patent troll is? Okay, so we'll, get, we'll talk about that in a second, but I do want you guys to keep an open mind, right? Because everything in the media, including from the government, talks about patent trolls being a bad thing. And part of it might depend on the definition, and part of it may depend on what these guys are actually doing to monetize the patents that they're buying. So let's talk about what is a patent troll. So there's no single, generally, universally accepted definition of what a patent troll is. The term is generally applied to companies that don't create or intend to create any products or services, but instead assert patents as their sole business model. So these guys buy patents and then monetize them by basically suing people. They don't produce anything. They don't uh, intend to create anything. They are holders of the patents. The law gives them a right to sue infringers, and they go after these infringers with patent in, in infringement lawsuits. Other terms for patent trolls include non-practicing entities, or MPEs, and patent assertion entities, or PAEs. Um, now, while troll, MPE, and PAE are often used interchangeably, the slight difference in definition matters. So, for example, universities and technology transfer offices may be non-practicing entities, but are not necessarily patent assertion entities. And this is where that definition first comes into focus for us, right? So it's not just a, a, an entity that's asserting infringement against other entities, or even a holder of a patent that is not practicing. Specifically, the way that people talk about patent trolls are owners of patents that don't produce anything, but as their sole business model, they go after other companies um, you know, for infringement remedies. Now, the reason why this is successful and lucrative is because uh, patent infringement lawsuits are very, very expensive. So the average patent infringement lawsuit can run a company two or three million dollars. Uh, so at the end of the day, if there is an NPE that goes after you, right, and, and gives you a letter and sends you a letter and saying, you are infringing my patent, now suddenly that company has a choice. That company has a choice to, to defend itself and incur legal costs in defending it and saying, at the end of the day, I'm not infringing the patent, or accepting, and this is the business model uh, for a lot of these patent trolls, accepting a license, right, and somehow saying, we will pay you for the... Uh, uh, the, the privilege of making you go away. I mean, that's effectively why a lot of people are against these patent trolls, because it seems like legalized blackmail and extortion and what, right? You, you will pay me money and I will go away and I will not see you in, in a court of law where you might spend a couple of million dollars to prove that I'm wrong. That is why a lot of people are against patent trolls in general. So it, are, are patent trolls or NPEs an innovation killer 
or is it a big money stooge, right? So when we think about patent trolls and how they are being described in the media, on the one hand, we're hearing about how they are innovation killers, right? So, so that companies, especially smaller companies, when they get these letters or demand letters from these MPEs or trolls, and they suddenly have to decide from a business perspective, does it make sense to fight it or not? You know, that's a bad thing, right? So if you're a small company and you can't afford to defend yourself, that is a bad thing because now you suddenly have to spend on legal as opposed to innovation and technology. But what about the bigger companies that have these patents and want to enforce them? You know, suppose there are some, these bigger companies like Google or Apple or Samsung, they have these patents, they want to enforce them. They may not be practicing that specific patent, but now they want to make sure that they can enforce that patent activity against something else. Or even more importantly, if you're a Google and suddenly you've been, you've been sued a hundred different times in the span of a few months against some of these patent trolls, it is in your interest to say, how do I make this go away? Right? So the question that comes out of this debate is that, is it an innovation killer, these patent trolls or non-practicing entities, or is it a function of big corporate interest saying, I don't want to be bothered and spend millions of dollars in defending my patents against others that may own technology that I might want to use? Um, so in the ninth, this is not a new phenomenon. In the 19th century, trolls were called patent sharks. And they went after farmers armed with patents on barbed wire and sliding gates. It sounds very strange, but at that time, that was the cutting edge technology. Ford was sued many, many, many times when it came out with the Model T for others that held patents that they claimed Ford was infringing. Now, the rise of software patents has created a bigger market for non-practicing entities. And the reason why is because software by its very nature is uh, not tangible. Right? So the question ends up being is these ideas that sometimes software creates, is it the idea or the implementation that you're getting that protection over and that patent over? Well, patents are never meant to protect ideas. They're, they're meant to protect innovation and inventions and implementations. So that's where we see the, the rub coming in. Because the software patents have been granted by the PTO in such large numbers you know, we need to take a step back and there is a lot of discussion about whether the PTO has gone too far, whether software patents in general should be rolled back because, you know, it, they're going too far and they're not protecting implementations, they're trying to protect ideas. And when we're talking about an innovation killer, there is some in, in, in interesting information that it does impact innovation. So according to a Boston University School of Law study, the direct cost for non-practicing entity disputes, patent trolls cost United States businesses more than $29 billion. And this data from, was from 2011. Patent litigation and lawsuits have only increased since that time. So imagine, you know, so the, the thought is, is that the number has also increased from 29 billion and gone up. There was a question back there? Yeah, is it known whether patent trolls have real patents behind them, or do they just make things up? Uh, well, so there are, they are real patents. When you talk about things being real patents, there are issued patents that they have behind them. Now, whether they can uh, stand up in a court of law with a real defense, that's the issue. So some companies have been very, very interesting in how they've been dealing with patent trolls lately. Uh, I forget the name of the company, but one company went out there and said, look, open source community, help me find prior art to invalidate the patent of this troll that is going after me. And that's been very successful. In a matter of minutes, some people have found prior art that they can now take back and say, look, you know what, your patent, at the end of the day, if we wanted to contest its validity, we can do that pretty easily. So yes, there are actual patents behind these NPEs, uh, but whether they're valid or can stand up uh, under closer scrutiny, that remains to be seen for each individual case. So uh, a couple, of, a couple of, uh, of, of infographics. So the number of patent troll lawsuits filed in the US alone in 2015, over 3,000, over 3,500. Referenced before, the number of patent suits Google had to fight simultaneously at one time were 100. Now again, now the average cost of a patent litigation lawsuit, if it's two or three million dollars, you can imagine why Google is very interested in making sure that these are, you know, the impact financially is minimized because they'd rather spend their money on something else. The number of patents asserted in lawsuits against J.P. Morgan Chase since 2008, 104. Now, who would think that a bank, right, would be embroiled in a lot of these patent litigation lawsuits? But when we turn to blockchain, where most of the patent filings are happening by financial institutions, you know, so some of the bigger banks are also being hit 
by these patent litigations. And the costs and legal fees alone to defend the average patent lawsuit, about $3 million. And we talked about the effect on innovation that these patent trolls and lawsuits have. Now, HBR, Harvard Business uh, Review, had uh, an infographic on the effect of patent troll lawsuits on innovation. So what they found was that the average R&D spending for a large firm, the reduction that these patent lawsuits created was minus 48%. R&D operating expenditures for a small firm, minus almost 20%. And the aggregate VC investment where these patent trolls are involved, minus 14%. So when we're talking about innovation and the killing of innovation, that's where we see these numbers, is less R&D spend, less VC investment, because there is a risk that you know that investment might go up in smoke. Or you might have that investment being spent on legal fees in defending these lawsuits instead of actual R&D spending. And here's the but, right? So, but, sorry. I'm trying to use my phone and the laptop at the same time. Uh, but uh, the question ends up being, why are the most blazingly innovative industries the ones with the most new patents and lawsuits? Right, so is this a check, chicken and the egg problem? Can we, are we gonna see patent trolls or non-practicing entities in industries that are mature and don't create innovation by itself? Does the innovation create the patent trolls? And if so, is this an issue that we really need to deal with? Right, because the innovation is already there. If there wasn't any innovation, these guys wouldn't be interested in monetizing the patents and then going after other companies. So is that one way to look at it? And without innovation, can you have patent trolls? So when we're talking about the reduction in innovation or VC spend and R&D expenditures, the reason why patent trolls have an effect on those R&D expenditures is because the innovation is happening in the first place. So the real question is not that innovation is being killed. The real question is, you know, do these patent trolls with their very function indicate that there is a robust market for this innovation happening? And then the question becomes is if we reduce this activity, yes, it's more money in the pockets of people that own patents and are actually doing work that's innovative, but what effect does that have and who does it benefit? And whether patent trolls have a useful function. Now the government uniformly says no. So especially the Obama administration did a lot to tar start teeing up the issue of how do we eliminate the effect of patent trolls. And there's some state legislation, for example, Vermont passed a, a, a statute in 2013 making it more onerous for non-practicing entities to actually bring an enforcement litigation against the company. Now, that statute has not been tested yet under preemption, right? So the general idea in, 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 in the law is that uh, each level of successful government up trumps the one underneath if, if, the, uh, if the field is occupied. So state legislation will trump municipal, federal will trump uh, state. So if, if the patent statute, if the patent laws trump, the if, if they basically take over the field of patent enforcement generally, then the state may not have the authority to pass legislation to make it harder for these patent trolls to practice. That has not been tested in the court, but that is an example of a state that's actually trying to do something in the absence of federal legislation you know, towards that effect. And there has been movement towards federal legislation to reduce the effect of patent trolls generally. Now the courts have also started weighing in on, on this issue, not from a policy perspective to talk about whether patent trolls are good or bad, but specifically making it more difficult for patent trolls and non-practicing entities to have their day in court. Now the issue and the question that I have for everybody is, is this a good thing or, or a bad thing? So when we, one of the most famous cases on the patent litigation side that's come out over the last couple of years is Alice v. CLS Bank. Uh, Alice Corporation held a number of patents for facilitating financial exchanges between two parties by using a computer as a third party. And CLS Bank was a foreign currency exchange company and filed a claim that the patents were invalid, unenforceable, and not infringed. The US Supreme Court ruled in favor of CLS, reasoning that the third party intermediation software that was being used was a fundamental building block of the economy and not a novel invention. 
and that merely requiring generic computer implementation fails to transform that abstract idea into a patent eligible invention. So some of the things we were talking about before, very briefly, right? Idea versus implementation. So Alice basically said that the idea alone cannot be patented. And it decided unanimously that merely implementing an idea on a computer isn't enough to transform it into a patentable invention. It has to be an implementation of a, a, a patentable idea by itself. Um, now, the Alice decision did not address the existence of what do we do about patent trolls that have existing patents today or the high cost of lawsuits. But moving forward, this, this standard will be used by the PTO and has been being used by the PTO to apply to software patents, making it more difficult for software patents to be issued generally. Now, for people in the room that are app developers and in the security space, how do people feel about that? is that it's been very, very broad and very easy to get software patents generally. Two years ago with Alice, that became very much more constrained. And it became easier for defendants that are being accused of infringement to come in and say, look, you know what, the patent should have never issued in the first place because it was patenting an idea or it was just a computer implementation of an idea. It is not a patentable invention itself. Just a couple of months ago, the Supreme Court decided T.C. Heartland v. Kraft Foods. Now, the background here is that there are venues across the country that have been havens for plaintiffs and patent trolls to file these patent infringement lawsuits because of a specific technical issue around venue. Where can these suits be filed? And so in 2015, 45% of all patent cases were filed in the Eastern District of Texas in Marshall as this court was known for favoring plaintiffs and for its expertise in patent suits. Marshall, Texas, who would have known, right? But 45% of all patent lawsuits uh, were filed there. In May of 2017, the Supreme Court uh, ruled in a unanimous decision that patent litigation cases must be heard in the state in which the defendant is incorporated or where the infringement is actually taking place. And it shuts down this option for plaintiffs to file the lawsuits in this, uh, in this, in this, in this court. Now, what's happened, right, is that the judges of that court have found creative ways to get around that a little bit, right? They are, after all, lawyers. Um, but what is anticipated is that practically what this is going to mean is most businesses are incorporated in Delaware. So there's going to be a lot and an upsurge of patent litigation filings in Delaware, so good for patent litigators in Delaware. Um, and the other thing it does is that specifically, depending on the venue that these patent litigation lawsuits are filed, you end up getting more information or less information on the front end of that litigation. So in Texas, there was a lot of information that defendants had to give up when you filed a lawsuit there. In Delaware, it's less so. So if you're a plaintiff, you're going to be getting a lot less information, and that means a lot less cost for a defendant. That may not make it, may allow you not to have as much leverage as you did by filing these lawsuits in Texas. So those are two major decisions that have been, uh, that have been uh, uh, that came out over the last couple of years. So again, the question for people in the audience from a policy perspective, are MPEs killing innovation or just simply exploiting a patent system that really has worked for 200 years? Again, this is not a new concept. It's existed in the 19th century where we had these patent trolls or non-practicing entities enforcing their rights. Um, should we leave let well enough alone? Or is there a benefit of making sure that the number of non-practicing entities actually are reduced and how they can file lawsuits? And I'm, shaking, I'm seeing nodding heads, right, because these are very expensive. And over the last 200 years, the cost of defending a patent lawsuit obviously has grown exponentially. Um, by doing that, though, are, you, are we really saying that if you have a patent and you want to enforce it, then basically F you? Right? So these non-practicing entities, at the end of the day, do own patents that are valid. They were issued by the PTO. And the same point that was made before is that sometimes these NPEs take these patents away from smaller companies by paying them money that they may need. So a smaller company might say, look, I have this patented technology. I'm not going to use it for my business. How do I monetize it? Let me sell it to a non-practicing entity. That doesn't sound like a bad thing. But if that non-practicing entity now then uses it for offensive litigation, that's really the issue that we're dealing with. Again, though, how do we eliminate it? What's that line that we draw to make sure that smaller companies can monetize some of their IP, but at the same time, these NPEs don't create, uh, or there's no incentive for these patent trolls to actually create lawsuits against defendants. 
And the third question that comes out of this is, has the system been crippled through overbroad software patents and forum shopping? So for people in the audience, is, do people have a view on whether software patents generally have been overbroad and how they've been issued over the last 20 years? Does anybody want to comment on that in the back? Uh, I'm a small practitioner with a five-person company. We had a contract with Netflix to do a very small amount of work for them. We would have no external. Oh, sorry. Sorry. We would have no external visibility. Do I put it off? Thank you which would have no external visibility, this piece of work. And of course, the contract said, indemnify us, Netflix, your tiny company, for any software patent infringement. And when I pointed out that would be a sham to the uh, counsel for Netflix, he said, tough luck, you have to agree to it. I said, but you assume that risk for all your employees, the risk of soft software patent infringement. This person will be closely um, closely monitored by an engineer at Netflix, and we won't be inventing anything, and it'll be internal use only technology. He said, tough luck. So I went out and looked for insurance, patent indemnification insurance. It would have cost us 30 days worth of an engineer's billing mm. to get that insurance policy. So it had a completely chilling effect. It killed our contract. So I think it is a problem. Uh, and by the way, that distribution of power between uh, two parties agreeing to a contract is quite asymmetric. It is quite asymmetric, absolutely, and, and mostly around some of those indemnification provisions and limitations of liability. And a company against a company like Netflix will never change their agreement. But that you did the right thing is look for that insurance. But it does remind me of you know taking it out of the software context when we're talk, thinking about the the argument we've been getting from from doctors for such a long time that these medical malpractice lawsuits have a chilling effect on their ability to practice medicine because a malpractice premium is being so high. Same, it, it's, it's an analogous example, right? So, so there's another uh, industry where malpractice has been, where the liability has been assumed by the government. It's museums, which have art to, on display, and they're worried about the theft of the art. If they didn't have insurance protecting the art from theft, no collector or owner of art would ever lend it to a museum. But the cost of the insurance is gigantic. So as it turns out, there's federal insurance against theft of museum art, and there has been exactly one $3,000 claim in the last 20 years that the feds assumed that insurance. Now, that's a very interesting issue, right, as to what type of insurance risk should the federal government take on. They took on that. They took on you know, uh, the issue around vaccinations, um, the issue around products liability concerns for uh, cybersecurity issues for uh, open source software or software generally is something that you know, maybe the government takes on at some point just to make sure that the IoT ecosystem works effectively. But it's interesting on the patent side or copyright or trademark, how does the government effectively take that on? That's the question. Um, and and is, it, is it a backstop that the government should be taking on? Because what the government is basically doing at that point is saying, look, you know, instead of letting the market set those prices, we're going to backstop and allow people to be protected against patent infringement. What does that do from a marketplace perspective? Does it create unnecessary risks where people go out and infringe other people's intellectual property because the cost of that insurance has, has now decreased? But an interesting issue as to how we deal with that. So before, um, I have exactly 30 seconds, right? So I'm going to talk about blockchain for a second, and not separately, because we could talk about blockchain for hours and days, right? It's, 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 it's one of the hottest areas right now that uh, we're dealing with. Um, but the, the specific issue that I wanted to raise with blockchain is the patentability of patents around blockchain technology. Now, you know, the technology itself, mostly public. Um, but one thing that could close off the technology comes in the form of patents as a lot of the big banks and the financial institutions file applications that seek patent protection over various aspects of blockchain, um, specifically around security and encryption techniques. And the question is, is it necessary for innovation? Is, is it, 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 will innovation stop if suddenly the banks or other entities can't get these patents? Uh, for these elements of blockchain technologies? Should they be able to get those patents around the, some of these technologies? And then what do, they, what do they do with it? Are they going to enforce it? Now, if you hear the big banks, what they say is that we're getting a lot of this patented 
blockchain. We're filing these applications for defensive purposes only. There are a lot of patent trolls out there. We want to make sure that we protect our technology. We're only doing it for defensive purposes. I don't know the answer to that. Nobody really does and how it's going to shake out. Um, but the effect of open source on the patentability of blockchain modules is an issue. Uh, the other issue is how do we make this into the most fair system around um, you know, patentability of blockchain and how far do we go? So there are various tools that have been proposed and are actually being implemented in patents in general about how do we create this ecosystem where the effects of patent trolls are lessened, but at the same time we can use uh, you know, patents to protect intellectual property. Non-aggression agreements, basically going out into a pool of, of other companies and saying we will not sue each other. Uh, patent pools, where the patents are pooled into a common area and then licensed out to companies in that pool. Strategic protection, getting your own patents around your technology so that if somebody sues you, you can play that game of, well, I'm going to sue you back and let's reach an agreement and cross license this technology to each other. And then license on transfer models where, you know what, if you do have a patent over a technology, if you agree to license it to a non-practicing entity, you must make that license available to other companies in that pool that you're dealing with so that everybody has a license to that technology. The question that comes out of this is, is it good for the blockchain ecosystem? And then who is it good for generally? Because a lot of these pools, a lot of these implementations are being done by larger corporations. So if larger corporations are being hurt and innovation is still going on, who is this ultimately protecting, which is the whole debate around patent trolls, non-practicing entities, and their effect on innovative technologies like blockchain. Uh, I'm out of time, but uh, I think there's one question. How do you leave out publishing? Publishing. Publishing instead of patenting to establish the prior art. I'm sorry. As an, as a, in the last board. Well, so that's, that's the effect of open source. So it's not just open source software, but putting it out in the public domain, absolutely. Because publication does kill your patent rights, right? So, and with that, I will I will end it. If there's any questions, I'm happy to take them. But thank you very much for your time today.